Mm -hmm. All right. So the context here, as a reminder, is that we were having a crash in our CrabKey tool, um, where CrabKey is this tool for investigating um, the correctness of or the, the memory safety of, of unsafe programs and validating that they break, they, they, they follow the stack borrows model. And I was seeing something weird where I was trying to add a new primitive for printing the tag of a, um, of a value, um, like the, a what this Y here, this, is, this code is working where it's, it's got a local value. It borrows the value mutably into X. It then casts that borrowed thing into an unsafe pointer. It takes another borrow of, um, the, the dereference of X and stores that into Y, keeps that around as a, um, for various reasons into another, actually it doesn't, doesn't actually make use of this Y address that we gather here. Um, then we do this print tag of, which was the thing that I added, a feature I was trying to add mm -hmm. to investigate what the tag is associated with Y. And the thing that I started happening is that this seemed to corrupt the state of Y itself, where um, the subsequent attempt to, to write into Y was writing into the wrong place. And this manifests itself in Valgren when I ran the code by alerting me saying this is like an incorrect address. Um, it doesn't make any sense. So when I was investigating this, um, I did a trace of this in RR and then uploaded the trace to Pronosco, as you, as you, I think, are sort of aware. Mm -hmm. And so the interface for this is that the, the standard output I added a lot of stuff to crab cake over the course of, of doing this. Like I ended up ex like augmenting our, um, our stuff to say like a bunch, add, add a bunch of extra print statements to various places like here, um, where I like added a Boolean flag to be like, I need to start keeping track of like every place this is called um, mm -hmm. when, when this is basically, as soon as we hit, one of these client requests. Um, so for people watching the video, the, 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 the client request mechanism is a way that Valgrind, when it reads in this program, there's a way where it will detect certain assembly code sequences. Um, and these are hidden right now behind these macros, like KC borrow mute, and then within print tag up, there's another use of a similar macro. We'll get into that in a little bit in terms of what those look like, but the, the abstraction is meant to be that when you run the program normally, it behaves one way. And then when you run under, under Valgrind, this thing gets replaced with new code. In particular, like print tag of gets replaced with something that's going to call into the Valgrind tool. And it ends up, in all those cases, they all end up flowing through this handle client request um, function, which we then get debugging info about. We see like dispatching code, blah, blah, blah. So, and that's reflected here in the standard output standard error, where we see this output. Um, and the other thing I'll note is that the, the Pronosco interface, when I click in this thing, it will jump to the point in the program that was running um, at the point where it was when it emitted that output. This is a trace of what uh, I captured a trace of running Valgrind on the program itself. So this is a, um, a run of the CrabPeak tool as in what the Valgrind tool that is that takes in the program and rewrites it on the fly. And so we see calls when we click on things like print tag, uh, like with this dispatching thing here, for example, we can find the call to um, KC handle client request. And you can see here that exact bit of code that I showed in that other window, right? KC client request here um, corresponds to the code that I'm showing right here, right? And then, and this is so we can, so we can see how there's a correspondence between where we are in the code here. This green line represents that we are, um, we've clicked on this line here, and this is where we are sitting, at least at this point in the stack. And you go, you go, deep, you can go deep because uh, the actual act of writing to the screen is is complicated and involves a syscall, so you can get really deep in the whole thing. But in terms of our mental model, this is what matters. Now, here's the thing: I added a whole bunch of output to try to understand the problem, but the heart of it is this. Um, that Y that we talked about, bar, the borrow that it has, I observed that Y has, um, it starts off having a useful value as an address that represents um, useful content. And, that, and that's what this thing is right here. Um, if you look, this 0x1FF EFFFF96 is, mm -hmm. is the address that we want, we want Y to carry. Um, 
and there's also the tag associated with that with that value for y that's a separate thing that the dogger tool is maintaining but the important thing in terms of what we observed is at this point in the control flow we believe that y had this address um mm -hmm. I say we believe it because the way we're observing it here, to be clear, is that um, we're we're doing this client request, this call to print tag of where we pass in this value of y, and so I'm we're hoping that you know the thing that gets printed to the screen actually represents what the value of y is. It's, it's it's we still have to like go through and dissect things to better understand it, but that's that's the hope. And the only other thing I'll mention is that in the Penosco tool, when you click do these clicking when you click around and things, it'll give you this notebook where you can take notes. You can say, oh, there's something interesting I want to note about this. And so the print tag in particular, you'll notice it's highlighted in yellow over, he over here. It's because in the notebook, I have chosen to give it the yellow. After I created this note, I chose to give it a yellow highlight so that even when I click elsewhere, we have a recording of everywhere you see yellow is what was emitted. Um, at that point, the control flow. So you can see in the data, the, we'll, we'll talk about data flow views in a bit, but the point is that this yellow thing is in the in the, the, the instruction stream that ran and the trace that ran that's going to be colored in yellow and that corresponds to that point in the control flow uh, a way to make this really concrete actually is to show you the actual instructions executed view which shows you all the instructions that were executed in order um because that's that's part of the trace is that you've captured that 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 activity and so you can see right uh darn it you can see like here, that that yellow thing corresponds to this this actual instruction in the assembly code where it was returning from a system call. That's what this this line corresponds to when I hit that that to the call there because it's the actual act of doing a system call to emit something to the screen um, mm -hmm. after it's built up the buffers and sent that to the kernel and so on. Okay, now the actual problem at hand then is that at this point in the control flow we observe Y having this address and this is a good address. This is the one we like to see. At this point down here, um, we see some complaints about this strange looking address. And this strange looking address is one that I actually injected deliberately after I noticed some corruption, state corruption issues. You'll notice it says 23454321. And mm -hmm. that is from, to be clear, um, I added code to the client request mechanism that would return that value so I could keep track of it. So clicking here, we see a data flow view about about these this 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 value here um, and how it's generated. But the important thing is that that's not going to actually help us find this. Um, the the place where it comes from is in the client request code for print tag of the way it's implemented in our whole system is that we have this handle client request that dispatches to that call and returns of and it does stuff it returns a handled value to say oh i handled this thing and it's and, and if, it, if you say you handled it you're supposed to set up a return value and so inside of the implementation of this you'll see that actually here's where that address that that strange address i've created it this is code that we control in rs hello source lib so i'm mm -hmm. right i'm saying if we're going to say it's handled write this crazy address into the return value because i want to keep track of what it's treated like a radioactive tracer element you can check the you can inject with the human body to see where it goes in the bloodstream. It's the same sort of idea here. I want to know where this thing ended up. And so mm -hmm. we can see that strange value um, arising. It, it, the, the system alerts about it here when it says no stack for address 23454321. But in fact, when I added a bunch more instrumentation, I observed it happening even like on this part that's in red here, um, where we see that the value 23454321 was observed um from a point where i instrumented the code to say uh at the valgrind level the get 32 um operation in the vex instruction set the abstract instruction set that that valgrind uses was returning 23454321 so here's here's some questions that immediately arise is how did that value end up like there right how did it end up at the offset 32 and whatever like uh, the abstraction here is that these when you do a get of offset 32 there's a guest a guest state that represents the the structure the mm, the compute the state of the abstract computer that is the guest in particular it's like the registers of of the computer that you're trying to model um and this particular get 32 it took me a long time to figure this out 
but effectively um the get 32 here is itself um and this is also maybe a little bit confusing i i spit out this output here this hello from rs shadow get with val that corresponds to this so this code being run from rust and you can see the stack trace for that here where it like is calls into these these it it calls into this from um this point in the assembly code um let's see if i jump to the beginning oh the interface here this stack trace that, that that's up here you know you can it's just like in a debugger where you could traverse the stack but another thing you can do is you can say look for this function call it's somewhere in the middle of this call to rs shadow get with val you can use this forward and backward button to jump to the exact beginning or exact end of that function call so it's an easy way to jump to the exact exit point or exact entry point of a give of any of the any of these functions so if i wanted to see where get with val returned i can click on the one that's the end point and it jumps to that endpoint in particular in the machine code in the trace you can see that we're at the return instruction and the next instruction is effectively what runs after that point in the context where that call happened and when you're talking about JIT compiled code where we have generated code on the fly and have calls to c functions from that generated code like this kind of jumping around is really important to understand because in a debugger like i can't look at this address here and make any sense of it like the JIT compiled code I don't have any useful debug information to look at, but what I do have is like the context of other calls that happened, like the call to RS Shadow get with Val. I can see, oh, that was this, that return to this point here. So this is some instruction that was JIT compiled right after the JIT compilation of the call to um, RS Shadow get with Val. Does that, does that make sense in terms of like, when you're thinking about the code that's been generated into machine code and how we don't have a good way of like mapping those individual instructions to the original source code or even the original binary that we've rewritten, but we at least can get some context by looking at the the overall control flow here. Does that does that make sense, Brian? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, if we're generating the code on the fly, there's no there's nowhere we can go back to to like point us the the code that it's based off of right it's just the machine code or the instructions that's right that's right and so i'm just pointing out here that this is a um a technique for like trying to make some sense out of like what you're seeing overall in particular i observed this bad value here from this this instrumentation of rs shadow get with val that mm -hmm. was created and in in, in crabkick itself those calls are created um, from pretty deep within the system. Like that's from those, that call is happening via this IR, unsafe IR dirty call here, but this is part mm -hmm. of a like recursive construction routine that's building up, that traverses a whole expression and builds up a shadow evaluation expression to com compute the shadow state. And the place where you see that being used, um, is like basically everything that does every when you instrument a statement in valgrind and it has a sub expression to evaluate it constructs the shadow data it, it, for every sub expression that you find so a good example let's say um the store the store operation there's going to be an, a, an expression to compute the address you're storing into and an, exp an expression to compute the data you're storing and for both of those, we want to compute the shadow state for the address and for the data. And these are separate pieces of extra state that we have to compute, or rather we have to build up expressions that compute them. And that's what these recursive routines are themselves doing. And then once it does that, it will then um, build the code that actually performs the store itself and as part of that, where is this? This is a bit maybe the worst one to look at because it's so hard to read. But the, 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 the crucial idea is that there's two things that happen. There's the actual statement that we're trying to compile. I have to see if that's something important. Um, no, it's not something important. Um, 
there's the statement itself that we are processing, the store statement that we're processing. And that we always, it, it, the, the general pattern here in Crab Cake is that we're always going to emit that operation, but we're, but we're also going to, in many cases, emit a separate operation immediately beforehand that computes, that does whatever predicates you want to check or computes whatever shadow state you need to update. All that kind of extra stuff gets generated first. And then after those things that happen, and those things often have side effects or can have side effects, immediately after those occur is when the actual event statement that you were, that was the basis for this thing being injected, only after you do the injected thing do you do the original one. And that's, the, that's a general pattern. And the reason I point this out is because one reason I got so bogged down, there were many reasons why I had a hard time debugging this problem. But one reason is that I forgot this detail that the the standard the output that you get in these traces to the screen those are almost always coming from these dirty statements these things that are running and tracing over the execution and calling to the rest the RS hello code any output that we see the screen is almost certainly coming from these operations but if what you care about is this one here you need to remember that's a separate thing. And this dirty statement might be a large, complicated expression that gets run and does stuff like prints the screen. And only after all that finishes does it and then say, oh, yeah, and now let's actually run the statement you cared about. The reason mm. this is so important that this difference is so important is because I wasted a lot of time staring at wondering how did this value flow here and why does it matter? But the thing yeah. to remember is this uh or no sorry not that one this one how did this value flow here and how did it matter but this is from that dirty routine that's that's attached to um that's injected here and that's not actually what's relevant to the bug in question the thing that's relevant to the bug in question was the the thing that immediately follows um so there was our shadow get with val ran and then at the very end of it, we return and we called another trace routine, this right temp, because in fact, RS shadow get with val is an expression. And what we're doing here is a, um, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been looking, I've been, I've been pointing you at Casey instrument store, but it's actually right temp, I think is the, uh, it's much shorter. <laughs> it's, it's the simpler, it's much simpler, but it's the same idea. You see the dirty routine and the, the trace associated with that, but then the actual statement after that. So. What we have here is a call to trace right temp, and that ran here. Uh, that ran here and did stuff. And at the end of it, it finished running, and we are now we're here. And I want to show you something. You see what this value is? Mm, yeah. Can, can you read the screen there? Right. This is this is the radioactive one, right? This is the two, three, four, five, four, right. three, two, one value. And it's writing mm -hmm. to RBX um, here. And the crucial thing is that uh sorry, sorry. No, the code, the code would no, it's not right. I'm sorry, I, I spoke. It's not writing to RBX. It's taking what's in RBX and writing it into this other memory location. The actual instruction that's being run is this one a move from RBX into this memory location, which is the memory location 1002003590. Yeah. So the most important insight right now is that this represents some corruption or this represents a write into some piece of state. And that memory address might be really important in terms of like the fact that this got overwritten might be really, really important. So a tool you can use here in Pronosco is you can say, I want to look at all the writes to that particular memory location, 1002003590. You can you can write this down as a memory address in Pronosco. Um, and it spits out all the places that thing was written to. And in particular, we can see here is the place where we wrote our here's the nasty value, right? This the whole point is where this thing is the nasty case. And then mm -hmm. right before it, the value it had before is the good value this is the good address mm -hmm. that we we wanted to see up here so you can see how there's definitely a like it's a very strong signal here that the state was corrupt that something was being corrupted 
between here and here, right? So mm -hmm. that was the first big insight was for me to see that this memory location is getting getting overridden and it, it matters. So but this memory location the is, I, the, is the location of the variable y? No, it's not. It's not the location of variable y. That's a good, that's a good guess. Um, so I spent a while trying to figure this out and a couple different things led to me figuring out what's going on here. So one of the things is I looked at um, where this value is being written. That was here. And then uh, where is the location of Y? Is that the case? Now, now you've got, now I'm wondering if I'm confusing myself. No, I don't think so though. Um, I don't think it is. Why was this one here that matters? So there's different places. So this was where we write, no, we write, we're writing RBX into, if I might write this, this is a write from RBX into that memory location. And this memory location, I believe, is the same one that gets, well, the, the short, well, let's see. There's a couple different versions of this story. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm debating about which one is the important one to tell. So I'm pretty sure that this, what this actually is, this memory location, is it's the representation of an important piece of guest state. Um, Okay, actually, no, a better answer your question. It is the location of Y, yes. But the question is, how is Y represented and why is this the location of Y? So you're, you're, you're actually right, it is, it is the location of Y. Sorry, I, 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 I'm confusing so many things at once because it's a, bi a big topic. Um, mm -hmm. It is the location of Y. In particular, lo we already sort of talked about how the location of Y, I think we talked about this, it's this get 32, um, that is the location of Y there. And so this is this may not be the place that actually is the one that corrupts it. And I think about this out loud, um, but the get of 32 is, is the crucial thing. There's a get of 32 that, that represents reading the corrupted value. And the question is, is that the location of Y? And my claim is it is the location of Y because here, when we wrote to this location here, um, that corresponded to this line. So I clicked, I clicked on this right location here and this says that's, that's the course. Oh, sorry. There's a new feature in Pronosco. If you click in the assembly code, it, it jumps into the Intel reference manual, which is not what I really want here. Here we have a right of the good value, the good address we want to see into the memory address that we care about, right? This, this one zero zero two zero zero three five nine zero that comes mm -hmm. from this location right here. And a methodology that I started using, I don't know whether I'd recommend it in general, but I did employ it. And so I want to at least talk about it with you. I wanted to know where this instruction came from. Why were we seeing a write of this value into this memory address? And there is an option that we have, since we are sitting here with Balgrind, we can say, look, I want to know, um, this is an instruction in the machine code that's dynamically created. This is something that's in, like, if you look at the stack trace, there's no useful debug information because this is something that's just in somewhere that's heap allocated that's been, that's been um, written dynamically. So you would think we don't have much of a prayer figuring out where, what this is and what it came from, but a technique you can use if you're, if you dare is you can say, I want to see the values of that memory location over time it got written at some point. It started at zero and it got written to 76. You can click on that to see where it got written and you get into the part of Valgrind itself where it generated the machine code itself. Um, we are now mm -hmm. at the point in the instruction stream where it actually created that, that instruction that we eventually run. And if you want to take the time, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. I, I spent a long time figuring this out but you can work backwards as in you can say oh this thing was um i i brought up a local variable here i'll move to the top of the screen up here um so for example i'm writing the di from i'm writing the di from si 
which is just a recast form of the source and desk. There's an S and D pointer, an S I D I pointer. It's the same. It's a, it's you know aliasing the two sets of uh, the same the same uh, source and desk arrays. So what that means is you can click on the destination or the source. You can click on the source to say where did the source come from, and use that to um, to track through how this value where it came about to the point where you can backtrace to when this this actual AMD instruction was generated. And if you're careful and do this, <laughs> I can't stress enough, like it's not, this is not easy to do and doing it on the fly here is, is maybe a bad idea for me, um, but you can figure out how this thing was initialized. Uh, you can figure out the exact point in Valgren's execution where it selected that statement and what it used to build that statement. In particular, with a couple of clicks, I have now worked my way backwards to the data flow where this dirty statement was constructed originally. Um, and for, all, for this dirty thing here. So I'm mostly saying this as like an illustration of an idea. I'm not claiming that this is taking us anywhere useful right now, but it was something that I did before to like track down where the instructions got constructed that were mm -hmm. the problematic instructions. And that's what I have notes in the notebook right now about where I observed um, things getting constructed. In particular, uh, where was it? Now I'm not even sure I'm going to go find it on the on the fly, um, but I'm pretty sure I had I had tracked this down and taken taken notes about the construction of these things, but I can't find it now. Let's see. Well, all right. I will just say that was a method I used to like look at individual instructions that were either reading a value from mem that memory location or overwriting the value of the memory location, and the crucial point then was that. I used that methodology to detect um, where things were being built up. And from that, I figured out that the Y variable is represented by offset 32. A put, a put to offset 32 is the write to Y. And a get from offset 32 is a read from Y. And mm -hmm. the question then becomes, I see no place, I saw no place in the code from, there was a write to Y as via put 32. There was a long time later, a read from offset 32. And in between those things, there was the corruption of the state at offset 32, right? And mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out why that was allowed, why it was allowed to have that corruption there. And eventually I worked out through the same kind of methodology I was describing earlier about, you know, looking through the flows, I found that, um, uh, yes, this is where the, like the radioactive address is being written to, this is where the corruption happens. This, this place right here, it's right. It's, and it's right after we call print tag of, we call print tag of, we, we spit out useful information and the, on the way back, as we're coming back mm -hmm. from the client request, there's this set client request retval, and it's this macro is corrupting um, the state. And and that's the the, the kept, ret is the one that you were setting directly with the two three four five four three two one in the. That's right. It's macro. writing. It's writing two three. It's writing two three uh, two three four five four three two one as the value into this same memory location that we've been we've been talking about. So this is where, uh -huh. as I said, this is where the corruption happens of that location. The first question I eventually worked my way towards is what is being overwritten here? What is this macro doing? And unfortunately, mm -hmm. Pronosco doesn't give us a great way to, to like browse the macros here, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. We've got our IDE, right, of, of various kinds. And so if we just look, um, we can find where this macro is defined. Um, and we can find the other macros that define the pieces of substructure that are relevant. In particular, this assignment here 
is actually a right to um, guest RDX on the guest states of this thread. And you can mm -hmm. even open, and you can in Pronosco, in fact, you can, you, what, you can, what you can do, even though you can't like browse the, um, the, you know, the macros and stuff that easily, what you can do is you can say, I want to investigate, uh, what is it called? The, um, uh, what's it called? Plain threads. Let's see. I, the problem is I don't remember what the name is. Oh, wait, I can look at the local. Can I look at the local variables? What can I look at? Uh, Are you talking about what it expands to, like the full name of the? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember what this what this macro like ends up turning plane. into this BG threads thing. It's BG, it BG plane BG... with a capital P. Underscore threads. Yeah. Yeah. That. Thank you. That's right. And then I need to dereference a couple of things. It's 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 index. It's it's TID one up here in the local variables, and then uh, there's some substructure I need to pull out. Um, it's uh, dot arch, I think. And then guest RDX, maybe? Or is it reg? Do I say regs first? Um, arch. Let's just try that. Nope. <laughs> uh, it's too much stuff for me to try to cons consume at once. Let's see. It's uh, mm -hmm. it probably is regs or something here. Let's just scroll up until I see the substructure that I want to look at. Uh, Vex, I think, is what I need. Nope, I was wrong about that too. What am I misreading here? Dot arch, I would think dot, or is it arrow Vex? Do I need to say arrow instead of dot? What am I doing wrong here? Mm. I'm surprised that dot didn't work there. Um, mm -hmm. This, it's irritating. I, I was doing this. I literally was doing this recently to um to illustrate this to to Nick. Actually, you know what? Let me go look at my history with Nick talking to them because I don't want to waste time trying to reverse engineer um how I figured that how I figured that out. Arch vex. Mm -hmm. No. Oh oh oh. Dot arch dot vex. There we go. So here we see the radioactive value. And then if mm -hmm. we just go one thing up and click there to say, I want to go back one step and we print it again and we see the good value. All right. So this is like really solid evidence that this line is corrupting the state. And so I was tearing my hair out, like I said, trying to figure out how is it legal for the client request to corrupt state that's being care that's, that's been stored in one place and clearly needs to be read subsequently. Right. Mm -hmm. And I eventually got around to looking at the code for the AMD um, definition. Yeah. Uh, for in, in Valgren, because it's in libvex guest AMD 64. And you see, like, right there, offset 32 is the guest RDX. Like, this all, mm -hmm. like, why is stored offset 32? That is the guest RDX. And so, Everything we're seeing makes sense once you get all those pictures together, right? The right, the put to offset 32 is mm -hmm. a right to RDX. That's that's the conceptually what's happening. Like as in when the original binary was, was read in, it saw a right to RDX and said, yep, that will we'll model that as a put to offset 32. And a later read from RDX was modeled as a as a read from uh, as a as a get from offset 32. So but we go back to this question: why is it legal for Valgrind to inject the this client request here and the eventual aha moment I had at some point was I said, wait a minute, our client request mechanism, we implemented in the code, the, the code that we're compiling here is this baseline .rs where we're the ones that wrote the client request code and mm -hmm. the protocol, the client request co code. So, that led me to say, what does it look like for Valgren versus for um, versus for uh, for us? Um, so if we look at, or no, I want to include Valgren.h. So in particular, this is the what the do client request expert looks like. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's got its special instruction preamble, which is this, you, you, as you well know, right? You, you were helping yeah. port this. Um, it's got these rotate instructions on RDI and then an exchange on RBX. Um, but, and, and so when you look at the corresponding code for us, it's inside of KC test dependencies, source lib, our corresponding code is we've inlined the special instruction preamble. That's these lines here, right? That corresponds to these lines on top of here. And we've got the exchange, mm -hmm. but the, and the only difference is I read it over this. I said to myself, I don't know what these annotations mean. I don't know what in out DX Z, Z, yeah. Q result means. And I, and I was suspicious because I saw CC here and I didn't see it over here. And I was suspicious that I exactly, saw memory yeah. here and I didn't see it over here, right? There's so many differences. It's, and, and then you also look and you see that the ZCQ args underscore zero here and it's all of ZCQ args here. Does that matter? Lots of questions, so many questions. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the one, I, I filed a bug about this, how we need to have a, like a proper review of all these things, but- Yeah, it was so hard something... to find out what, what even would be the equivalent. It was like, it's not, it was- yeah. And in fact, I just, I just realized something. I I pulled up the file, but it had the fix in it already. I'm sorry. That makes the whole thing, the whole extra is misleading. This wasn't <laughs> what I just showed you a moment ago. Wasn't the file that I was that we were running. We were running this one. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is what we actually had in our macro code when I was running into this. This in out yeah. di is talking about the di register. This equal d is talking about the dx register. Um, because what this is trying to model is this abstraction of, we have a yeah. call to the client because this, the whole point here is we're trying to model that Valgren might inject a procedure call. We're trying to tell the compiler at the time when we compile this code, hey, this thing might get replaced with a procedure call that will overwrite RDX. It's your job to save and restore RDX everywhere you see this instruction sequence. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. If you don't tell the compiler this, if you don't tell the compiler that this thing should be treated as something that writes to RDX, it doesn't know that it has to save and restore it. And so our version of the code, we didn't have any annotations saying RDX, we should, that you should need to treat this assembly sequence as potentially overwriting RDX. And thus the compiler didn't think it could, as in it didn't think this assembly sequence could ever overwrite RDX. And so it felt it was free to keep that register across that assembly code without saving and restoring it. Mm -hmm. So this is why we see this behavior is because the compiler, when it compiled baseline.rs, it believed between um, this, this, this yellow line up here, or really right before it, all the way to this red line, it basically said, I can safely leave the value of why in RDX, nothing between here and here will overwrite RDX. But that wasn't true because the assembly code, when Valgrind slurped it in, gets replaced mm -hmm. with something that could overwrite RDX. And what made this bug especially subtle is that it only overwrites RDX if the handle client request call returns true. If it doesn't return true, it doesn't run this macro and it wouldn't overwrite RDX. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned to you a couple of days ago or something that I noticed that if I stopped returning true from the handler, from the handled Boolean flag, that the problem went away. And the reason yeah. is because at that point it stopped overwriting RDX here because at that point um, it, 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 it then, you know, the compiler's assumptions about RDX being able to be live across that location went back to hold it being true in this, in this particular um, circumstance. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's the really big picture of what went wrong and um, and the methodology that I used to track it down, but it took a hell of a long time, as you, I think, can tell. Um, and the big questions are like, what are the ways to better deal with this? And I, I, I think I've talked to you a little bit, I, I filed some bugs or, or made some comments last night. The most immediate thing is that we have to be ready to, um, I think we need to be ready to write write tests in the C form as well as the Rust form, at least for the short term. We can start writing them in Rust, but we need to be ready to port anything we write in Rust to C to deal with cases like this. Like we see, if we see weirdness, until we are really, really certain 
that these machine code sequences are uh, actually equivalent. Yeah. Until we have a really strong assurance of that, we need to be ready to sort of drop into the other form and use the C-based one so that we can use Valgren's own macros to deal with this. So that was the sort of, it's either that or just say all tests have to be in both Rust and C all the time, which was my first reaction. My first reaction was to say we need to make, not maybe not all the tests, but a, a significant portion of the tests be in both languages. And then after I slept on, I was like, that's that's overkill. That That's a lot of effort without that much value because I don't know how many more bugs, we may not find that many more bugs mm -hmm. in between the two um, sequences. But yeah. that's the first thing is we need to be ready to, to drop from Rust to C for the tests. And the other, second thing is we need to properly do a review of, of these things. Um, I think just in speaking to you now, I've, I pointed out basically that, um, okay, the most immediate one is that this DI needs to be DX, but I'm super curious about like, I, I, you know, what the A is, yeah. what the zero is. And <laughs> so, okay, so you're totally right about the equals D because even in my blog post I mentioned, actually, if you look at my blog post, I explained what all of the, like the equals D and all those do. Um, but yeah, and I even wrote their RDF, so definitely nice find. Um, we might still have issues because um, I didn't find a way to express. So you see the memory, right? The uh, You have CC and then memory. And I never found yeah. what the equivalent was of the memory. It's doing like a clobber there. That's what it's indicating. But I can't find the equivalent in the Rust assembly syntax. So I basically, we don't have that memory line okay. represented. What about the, have CC? the CC? I, line. I, I look brief. The, the CC is condition yeah. codes, um, and I and what I read is that those don't those don't matter for Intel and AMD sixty four. Yeah, so what, what I, I read, found it, out was, uh huh. Yeah, what what I found out was that um, when you look at the Rust reference, it says that if the flags register isn't modified, then uh, you have you would have to explicitly set another option called preserves flag. So it seems like the behavior is flipped, like the default behavior is flipped between. In uh, like inline and C and inline and Rust, so we don't need to have CC because okay, we're not. I yeah. think the right answer then is for anything like that. I think what I'd recommend here, at least while we're in this development stage, is that we should have comments for everything that was in the Valgren one and say how mm -hmm. it's been expressed or it doesn't need to be expressed in the the corresponding Rust one. Like here, I'd say yeah. CC is implicit in the Rust as in macro, and to turn it right. off, you would use this other thing. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that seems good. What about this, the, the zero ZZQ default? Do you know what that's about? Or maybe I should look at your blog post. Yeah. Um, if it wrote well, I, I, can, I can explain it. Yeah, so the zero mean, so the zero ZZQ default means uh, you place the ZZQ default variable into the output operand at index zero of the list of input operands, which in this case would be RDX. Okay. Um, yeah. And what is that? So what does that correspond to in better. our? Well, what, mm -hmm. so is, is the idea then that for us, our use of in and in out covers that? Because wait, because well, here, the output goes into yeah. That's so that's another thing that I that I couldn't figure out. I wasn't able. I I didn't see the in out actually populate the registers ZZQ default at the start. Um, which is what it should be doing. So that's why what I oh. that's why I set ZZQ result at the beginning to be the default because I couldn't find any other way. Like the behavior, as far as I understood, it should be that when you have in out that it should be setting ZZQ default, but it, it doesn't seem to be no matter what I did with my testing. So well, wait, is the annotation it, meant to be a statement of what? Well, this is an important distinction. Is the uh, are these annotations supposed to be statements of? When the ASM gets compiled, it needs to inject other stuff to make certain conditions hold, or are they supposed to be statements about what the machine code does? Like, as in, like, I am saying that this machine code does initialize. Um, no, CCQ it's saying results. it's saying to do some additional things. So in this case, it's saying um, set set the register DX with the contents of ZZQ result before the assembly and then do the same thing at the end of the assembly like you're you're giving like Writing additional it back out. things yeah 
okay, it's a protocol for for transferring into the DX. Okay, for yeah, establishing. it's like extracting. It's like beginning. putting data I in no. and extracting it out of the assembly. Okay, okay, Otherwise, that there's actually no makes connection perfect sense. between the registers. Yeah. All right, that does make sense to me. I see, and you're saying that the the, the equivalent for or the whatever Valgrind is doing, it isn't that. It's doing something else to get a similar kind of thing. It sounds like, if I'm understanding you correctly, or it's getting something. Okay, I'll have to. I'll look up. I'll read your blog post. I think is the right answer here because I I now believe I understand what you're saying in terms of there isn't a one to one mapping of every little feature, but you yeah. were trying to re-express the intent using the features you had. That makes perfect sense right. to me. Um, mm -hmm. We just need to do a better job, I think, of because we're going to need to keep these things in sync. And like you can imagine, if there's changes to, I'm not expecting Valgrind to ever change these protocols. It would probably break the world, um, mm -hmm. but it still behooves us to like document um, in line on our side, like how yeah. these things match up. So For sure. okay, that's that's good. That's good lessons there. Um, okay. So I think then I've sort of spelled out everything that I discovered and wanted to talk to you about. Um, is there any questions you had? I realize in hindsight now that I may not have gotten into all the details that are really necessary to understand what the hell was going on. But maybe, maybe if you have any questions, this is a good time to ask them. Yeah, I have a question because, okay, so to kind of restate what you did, what you figured out is basically we were writing if you can go back to the code again with the macro. Um, yeah, yeah. So you changed, we had in out DI, right? So basically um, we were writing into or out of the wrong register. And so we um, needed we to were, change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we were doing was we were making a, the original, okay, so let me change it back to the code that was there. When we when when I arrived and looked at this, so this is what we had. What we had, we had a statement that used DI as the in out register, um, as in move ZZQ into DI at the beginning, and move DI out to ZZQ result after you finish running. That's my understanding of what you're saying that this in out means. And meanwhile, Valgrind itself, when it encounters these five instructions. This, these four mm -hmm. rotate lefts and this exchange instruction, it effectively replaces them with something else that has the effect of this or could have the effect of this, as in it's just mm -hmm. going to blow away RDX potentially. And so even though we were saying move into RDI and move out from RDI, Valgren's going to inject code to overwrite RDX. Um, mm, that's the heart yeah. of, and because, because of it reinterpreting these, these, um, five instructions to mean a client request that as part of it can return a value that's stored in RDX. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And I think so it makes sense. Of, I need to think that, about it a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. I, it, it's, it's, it's totally hard to get your head around. And then the crucial, the, the really crucial thing then is that with this in out parameter that's here. If the compiler, mm -hmm. for example, had some temporary variable that is stored in the RDI register and later read from the RDI register, but in the middle of that, it had one of these macros, it would say, oh, I can't keep RDI live across this assembly code sequence. Um, mm -hmm. It probably would say that anyway, because there's these rotate instructions here. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I don't know how smart compilers are in terms of whether they will read the actual machine code and infer from that the constraints that are quote unquote obvious from the machine code text, or if they rely solely on these annotations that are added on, I just don't know what the spec says in terms of what there, but I can imagine, I would hope, I don't know what to hope. I don't know what to hope about what compilers I think do. I think when um, you use inline assembly here, it's not gonna really assume anything unless you explicitly give like in, like the in out, there's a bunch of other types um, that can say like, other slightly different behaviors. Um, and I think it just bases sure. it off of those. And it bases it off of like, for example, the um, the next line down, like the in AX, that should be equivalent to the A in quotes on the other side. Um, so I think it just uses those things as hints, but other than that, it doesn't really help you at all. 
Okay. So the crucial point then is that this is, I believe that when the compiler interprets these, these annotations as written, it says, look, this machine code sequence, as part of compiling this assembly code sequence, I need to move ZZQ into RDI. And I also need to move RDI out into ZZQ result after it finishes. Also, I need to take the address of ZZQ args and move that into RA, RAX, right? That's part of mm -hmm. this, this, what this is saying. And so the whole sequence then, the compiler knows, look, no matter what else happens, um, I need to, uh, I'm going to be blowing away those registers and therefore I can't keep them live across, I, I, if, I mute, if I have some other temporary state in those registers, I need to spill it to the stack before mm -hmm. I run this machine code sequence and then restore it from the stack afterwards. So mm -hmm. that's that's how this current thing is interpreted. So it was, it therefore was saving and restoring RAX and RDI, presumably, if they were ever in any temporary variables or any temporary variables were using them. But RDX, RDX rather, putting emphasis on the, the X and RDX, um, mm -hmm. was not, was not recorded as something that could be overwritten. And therefore it in the baseline code, because the baseline code here conceptually is putting Y, is putting Y into RDX and then it's using it here. Wait, can you and show me which, print... which, where does it put Y into RDX? Uh, I believe it's, I believe it's that's how Y is represented in the in the compiled code. So if we look at the right thing to do here, actually, would be to um, try running the code directly. So let me mm -hmm. let me uh, recompile this as is, and but this time. Um, Something I real oh, another thing I realized actually as in terms of our testing process, something uh -huh. I never did and probably should have done very early on was um try running the code without like not under Valgrind. I don't know if that would have caught the problem here at all because it's not actually overwriting. Or maybe it will over well, okay. I don't know whether we're we're, we're not overwrite RDX in that case. Um, but that's something I was thinking about in terms of like testing strategy that we probably should be making sure that our programs behave the way we expect, even when they're not run under Valgrind. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Wait, so RDX run... is the return, it's the same as the return value or the return variable that we set when we do the, when we actually run the client requests, right? It is, it is, but it's also, yes, because it effectively is, when it runs a client request, it stores the result into okay. RDX. That, but that makes also... a lot of sense now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because basically what protocol. happens is like we we okay so and yeah so we basically if we're looking at just a C assembly before we run with it um before the inline assembly we put the ZCQ default into RDX right because that's what we'll do if we don't actually want to modify it and then the client request may or may not set RDX which is what you were talking about before and then after the inline assembly finishes, then we have to write in we have to write the contents of RDX into ZZQ result, but because I had DI, it was writing it somewhere else, right? It's only until you change it to DX that it actually correctly sets the value. Well, I think, it, right? or moreover, I mean, I don't know. Again, we, I'd have to go and this comment you made about how in out will get compiled by the as a macro into extra machine code. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to look more into that myself because the only thing I know is what Valgrind does in terms of how it interprets these four instructions in terms of replacing mm -hmm. them with yeah. effectively a write to RDX, a, a, a procedure call that ends up writing to RDX. Yeah. The surrounding context of what it does to initialize RDX and then move stuff out of RDX is a separate mm -hmm. issue that has made me very concerned, to be honest, about well, no, it says RDI here. So this maybe that maybe that all does make sense because right now we aren't writing to RDI. We're not writing to RDI RDX right now. We're writing it to RDI. Um, so this ASM sequence is going to write into RDI, not RDX, and it's going to write out from RDI, not RD, not mm -hmm. RDX, because yeah. of the in-out parameter referring to DI here. Um, 
I want to I, I wanted to double I wanted to see if I could quickly confirm um, uh, the claim earlier about that Y is being stored in RDI. So I was hoping that I might be able to um, validate that, but I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm going to have time um, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, okay. So let's see. Um, we are currently in this thing. Let me see. Uh, shoot, 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 shoot. Okay. Let me see. Okay, there's the rerun. Yeah, okay. Now we can break on main, maybe. Uh, Well, let's see. Um, is it Rust main that it's called? No, I don't remember. Sorry, I'm I'm remembering on the fly how to like even like step to the right place. Oh, baseline main, that's what I want. I bet there's not gonna be debug information though. I bet mm -hmm. I need to compile with the debug info. Yeah. Well. Unfortunately, I don't know if we have time right now for me to, to, to um, make an argument for why this is um, doing this. I don't think I have time to do it now. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my, I stand okay. by my claim, though, that my, my strong belief is that if we looked at the disassembly of uh -huh. baseline, that we would see evidence that Y is being um, stored into uh, into our is being rep its representation is as the register rdx that's like that's like the fundamental hypothesis that, uh, yeah. that, that or the assumption that everything i've found is is indicating i just didn't right concretely like i think if we looked at the dis you know what i can i can try one more thing um i can try disassembling um baseline itself um and then look for oh my god um, all right, maybe that's not effective either. I was just thinking that if we looked for um, the value 105, which I'd have to convert to hex, I guess, to find it quickly. Do you know what hex is? Mm -hmm. What 105 is in hex off the top of your head? I, just, I certainly do not. Let's find out if I can figure that out quickly here. I do not. It's 69. Of course it is. Um, okay, so. See, like. Uh, is that going to prove anything? It may not prove anything. There's a couple of the currents. There's how many currencies of, of there are of, the, of that of that value in this in this binary? <laughs> my my. Uh, are you uh, trying to it, find I the think... sequence for the client request? You could look for the exchange. Uh, I'm actually trying to find the identical. right. No, what I'm uh -huh. trying to find is the, you know what I just found. No, I did just find it. I just saw it a moment ago. What I was trying to find okay. was proof that y is 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 sorted by r by r d x. And I actually oh, just okay, saw it a okay. moment ago. I'll, I'll show you. Um, it's this. Oh, you're saying where we this store our number into the register. This this instruction right here is uh -huh. storing into the memory location. Like this is the yeah. star y mm -hmm. is parentheses around RDX. This is the proof that yes. y is RDX here. Um, I guess the thing is, I, I guess maybe I missed one part because I don't get why is it that why is it that RDX is picked for why you showed me in a few places where RDX is, or where like offset 30 is mentioned in RDX, but I didn't quite okay. make that connection. Yes, this makes sense. So this is the this is the code that we read in. Then if you run on our mm -hmm. architecture directly, you'll yeah. actually store it and register RDX. But um, if you want, but, but, the, but in terms of what Valgren does, there's plenty of times where it has to shift the tool that's running. Mm -hmm. And so it needs to take the current machine state and, and represent it as memory locations. It needs, to, it needs to dump the register state to a structure. And that structure mm -hmm. is this thing. Um, the, uh, in the, for AMD64, it's this guest state. And if you look at mm -hmm. offset 32, it's the RDX register. Like a get of 32 is saying get 
the guest's RDX register. A put of 32 is saying store to the guest's RDX oh, register because that's how we so represent. There's, there's, uh huh. The data, the entire data structure is the beginning is at some arbitrary address, and then you offset it to basically simulate all the different registers that would be running on the hardware, something like that. Yeah, well, the, the abstraction is that's right. The abstraction is that when you do put and get, it's conceptually storing those registers. And then when it when it JIT compiles it back to machine code, it's going to try mm -hmm. to turn those puts and gets into the actual register um, manipulations again. Mm, okay. So a put and get of RDX of 32 is going to turn into a write to, thir of, to a read and write of the RDX. A put and mm -hmm. get of 24 is going to turn into a read and write of RCX. Mm, okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Then maybe um, if you get a chance to look at my post, you can see it uh, where I mentioned like stuff I ran into, and then maybe that gives us a bit like then we can talk about that part too. Maybe we can find some stuff ahead of time as well, which cool. would be useful. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for the time, Brian. Um, I, I will. No I will review this video in high speed mode and see if I if it's any of any use to post on either YouTube or broadcast. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you.